Good evening, everyone. My name is Ratna Ray. I'm a professor of uh, sociology, South Asian studies, and geography here at Berkeley. On behalf of the Institute for South Asia Studies, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you to the second annual Patacharya Lecture on the Future of India. This lectureship is enabled by the Patacharya Fund, the Patacharya India Fund, which was established in 2016 with a generous contribution from Kimi and Shankar Patacharya, both long-term supporters of Bangla Studies at UC Berkeley, as well as of the Institute for South Asia Studies in general. The fund supports two initiatives, this lecture series and a graduate fellowship. And I want to say something first about the graduate fellowship. We are particularly grateful for the funding um, of graduate students, uh, especially for graduate student research, for this is what a university must do. We must encourage our students to go out and do the research to create new knowledge. The names of this year's Bhattacharya Research Award winners are Drew Cameron, Public Health, Gautami uh, Penakalapati, Erg, Meghna Mukherjee, Sociology. The names of those who uh, received travel grants from this fund um, to go to conferences are Anirvan Chaudhuri, Political Science, and Tanu Kumar, Political Science. I think there are a couple of current and past awardees who are present at the lecture. Um, if you are here, would you stand up? Lisa Brooks is here, she's a past winner. Congratulations. <laughs> the Bhattacharya Lecture Series on the Future of India attends to the fact that this is a moment of profound importance in India as it stands at the cusp of two worlds a democratic and inclusive world on the one hand, and a non-inclusive, neo-traditional world on the other. The annual lectureship is a forum where prominent figures, not only from the global academic community, but also from the world beyond academia, will share their ideas about where India is going economically, socially, and politically, with Berkeley and the larger community. I'd now like to invite Shankar Bhattacharya, um, our donor, to come up on stage and say a few words. Thank you, Raka. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, thank you very much for attending this uh, second Bhattacharya lecture. Uh, looking at the, the crowd, I'm really humbled. Thank you. Especially for a Friday afternoon, your attendance is really inspirational. Uh, Professor Rajan, thank you very much for accommodating us in your busy schedule. Uh, we have been waiting for this for some time. Bonita will tell you that uh, we've been waiting for you for about a year and a half. <laughs> but we understand your schedule. We are really looking forward to hearing your perspective of post-independence India, India's economic advancement and sustainability and how it is positioning itself for the 21st century. Besides your great academic and professional accomplishments, which is phenomenal, your, we admire your forthrightness and your straight talk. Your presentation in Jackson Hole in 2005 is a true testimonial of that. Also, how well you have navigated India during the financial crisis is remarkable. I want to also thank the South Asia Studies Institute for their leadership in organizing this program. My special thanks go to Raka, Sanchita, Punita, and their highly committed team. The Bharacharya Fund, as Raka alluded to, is created to promote the dialogue between the world's oldest and the largest operating democracies. In view of the current state of democracies across the world, it is incumbent upon us to engage in constructive dialogue to learn from each other's experience. The Bharacharya India Fund creates a platform to promote that dialogue. Professor Rajan, 
your lecture will go a long way towards that goal. Thank you all. Enjoy the evening. Thank you so much, Shankar. I'd like now to introduce you to the person who will introduce our speaker uh, today to you, Professor Pranab Bhartha, who is Professor of Graduate School, uh, a Professor of the Graduate School at the Department of Economics here at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Bardhan is one of the most renowned economists of development in the world, whose work on rural institutions in poor countries, on political economy, and on international trade has resulted in 14 books and many, 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 many articles. Particularly notable, I think, is Professor Bardhan's role as a public intellectual, who contributes thoughtfully to so many of the economic, political, and social debates of our time. He is therefore the perfect person to introduce the speaker of today, uh, Raghuram Rajan. Please, Pranatha. I thought my job is mainly to introduce our speaker. But we are, of course, have an Oscar style. The introducer gets introduced. <laughs> <laughs> Raghuram Rajan is a distinguished professor of finance in the University of Chicago School of Business. Of course, most Indians of course, know him for his role in the Indian government first as chief economic advisor in the Ministry of Finance and then in 2013 to 2016 he was the governor of the Reserve Bank of India. And before that, in, in internationally, 2003 to 6, if I remember right, he was the chief economist at the International Monetary Fund. <coughs> and globally, talking globally, uh, as it has already been hinted, uh, he was one of the few economists who warned us about the financial crisis of 2007 and 8. More than that, he clearly delineated the link between rising inequality and the looming financial crisis. So he of course is very well known both in India and abroad as a great public intellectual and of course one of the signs of that is that he causes it brings fire hazard. <laughs> Talking of fire hazard, this afternoon when Raghu and I were walking in the campus, um, in this today when the air was smoky, he take one sniff of the Berkeley air and he said, oh, I am reminded of home. <laughs> quality of air. But apart from being a public intellectual, he has a stellar reputation in research, particularly in areas of corporate finance and banking. In fact, in recognition for his research, he has been awarded many prizes and, uh, and, and awards, including the inaugural Fisher Black Prize in 2003, uh, which, which, was, which is given to the best finance researcher for someone below the age of 40. In 2011, he became the president of the American Finance Association. But you have not come here to listen to me, you have come here to listen to him, so I'm not going to stand between you and him. So, Please join me in welcoming Raghu Rajan to come. Thank you, Pranabda. Uh, thank you, Professor Ray. And uh, it's good to be speaking here. Thank you. Uh, 
everyone for coming today. Um, I'm, I have a few slides that had some visuals on them, uh, and unfortunately uh, you won't be able to see it, but I'll try and describe it to you, and uh, hopefully that will be sufficient. Uh, by the way, can you hear me back there? So first, happy Diwali to everybody. Uh, uh, we're, we're one day from, uh, a couple of days from Diwali, so it's important that... Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. So, uh, I'm trying to figure out which specs I will wear. Okay. So, what I want to do today is, is really uh, go a little academic first, talk a little bit about some of the numbers coming from India, talk about what India is, how India has been doing lately, uh, perhaps cut through some of the normal hype that you hear and, uh, uh, and ask what really is going on, uh, and then talk about some recent successes as well as not so great occurrences in India, and then focus on the, uh, on the issue before us today, what are India's key challenges in the years to come, and uh, I will talk about uh, essentially seven. Uh, one is of course very obvious to anybody who's been to India, which is the physical infrastructure. Uh, another which may be surprising to some of our friends here who meet people like you, uh, and say what, what wonderful human capital India has. And the truth is, the average level in India is, uh, requires, uh, requires far more investment. I'll talk about Indian human capital. I'll talk about int intellectual capital in India. As India is getting close to the frontiers uh, of, uh, of knowledge, how uh, intellectual capital has become so much more important and why we're facing uh, deficits there. Then I talk a little bit outside the area of economics, and now that I don't have any official position, I can I can <laughs> that. I talk about democratic engagement in India, why that's extremely important, and and how that has been faring in recent times. I will talk a little bit about private sector independence. India has a strong private sector, but how independent is it of the government? and uh, talk a little bit about government capacity and the institutional checks and balances on the government, some of which have been in the news lately. And finally, I'll end with what kind of vision should we have for India. So seven separate topics, which hopefully we can do in the next half hour or so. Let me start with some numbers on India. As you know, uh, you know India, uh, we pride ourselves on being the fastest growing large economy in the world, 7.3% uh, uh, last year, about around that same number or a little lower this year. But the reality is for 25 years India has been growing at about 7% on average. Now, except for the example of China, uh, which is so close to us, this would be considered phenomenal for any country at perhaps any time in history. 7% for 25 years is, is, really, uh, is really very, very strong uh, growth. But in some sense, this 7% has become the new Hindu rate of growth. Right? The, it used to be that, uh, was it K.N. Raj who coined the term? Or Raj Krishna. Raj Krishna coined the term Hindu rate of growth. That was 3.5% at that time. Now it's 7. Uh, the reality is 7 is not enough to absorb the kinds of people keep coming into the labor market today to create enough jobs for them. And so we need more. We cannot be satisfied with this level. In fact, if you look at the last uh, couple of years, we were growing, uh, uh, recovering from the Great Recession and growing from 2012 onwards uh, uh, for about four years until 2016 when we got hit with two successive shocks. One was the demonetization shock, and the second was the GST shock. And both those, coupled with the fact that in recent times oil prices have been going up, have been serious headwinds to growth in India. And growth has fallen off. Interestingly, and that was the chart I was going to show you, at a time that growth in the global economy has been picking up. 
India is sensitive to global growth. This is something people don't understand that well, that India has become a much more open economy. And if the world grows, we also grow more strongly. What's happened in the last, last year, 2017, is even as the world picked up, India went down. And that reflects the fact that these blows have been really, really hard blows. So we shouldn't be satisfied that we're growing close to seven. We should have been growing much faster, given what the world was doing. But because of these headwinds, we have been held back. So that's as far as growth goes. Uh, we are picking up again, but uh, there is still the issue of, of oil prices. Oil prices have come down recently. Whether they'll go up back again, whether there'll be a headwind is something to think about. And I say oil prices not likely, because a major factor in India's growth over the last two or three years has been the fact that oil prices have come down. You may say, why is this the case? Well, India obviously depends on oil. Right? We consume approximately uh, 5 million barrels a day. Okay? 5 million barrels, if it was priced at $91 a barrel versus $44 a barrel, that's $50 a barrel difference. Now my, multiply 50 into 5 million into 365 days a year, you seem to soon come up with a lot of money. Right? What happened in the last few years, last three years from 2014, is India got this oil windfall. And so what is surprising is, despite this oil windfall, we didn't grow any faster. Right? That suggests there were serious headwinds to growth in India. Now oil is going the other way. Oil prices have gone up, which means going forward, we still have to overcome whatever headwinds oil will create. But the broader point is that we can do better than where we are. We shouldn't be uh, overly happy with 7% growth. We need far more, especially to absorb all those people coming into the labor markets. Second uh, point is, uh, is on the fiscal deficit. Again, the reduction in oil prices helped us a lot. It helped us because uh, what happened was the government raised the taxes, raised excise taxes, and as a result, government revenues went up as the oil prices came down. That was a good thing the government did because in a sense, it kept the oil price from falling too far. But the fact is, some of our fiscal deficit improvement at the center has been because of these higher excise taxes. Now with oil prices going the other way, it is again going to become more of a headwind to growth uh, because the fiscal will not be so easy to manage. Nevertheless, what is interesting is, despite the center bringing down the fiscal deficit steadily since 2012, our aggregate fiscal deficit of center and state has not come down. In fact, over the last year, uh, three years, it's been going up. Why? Because even as the center is bring, bringing it down, the states have been spending more. So as a result, India's fiscal deficit, aggregate fiscal def deficit, is stuck at about 7% of GDP. That's a big number. So we talk about 7% being the highest growth rate amongst large countries. 7% fiscal deficit is approximately the highest amongst the G20 in terms of fiscal deficit. So let's talk about the bad numbers along with the good numbers. We need to improve on that considerably because a higher fiscal deficit can be a source of instability. Some of this shows up, again I keep coming back to the oil price, some of this shows up also in an expanded current account deficit. Some of you may wonder why the rupee has depreciated so much in the last few, few months. <laughs> And especially some of you are students from India, your parents are paying for you, they're spending rupees uh, for the dollars that they have to get and the dollar rupee exchange rate has fallen. Now, truth be told, uh, the pattern over time for the dollar rupee exchange rate is it stabilizes around a level, doesn't depreciate too much, and then wham, there is a bout of uh, market turmoil and it moves quite a bit and then it stabilizes again. But the reality is that when you look at India's numbers in the recent past, the one thing that's helping us is that our growth stands out relative to other large countries. But our dependence on oil means both the fiscal deficit widens when the oil price goes up, but also the current account deficit. The net uh, difference between uh, 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 investment and savings, what we have to finance from abroad, goes up as the oil price goes up. And that's the mirror image of what helped us when the oil price came down. 
So, so the reality is that things are a little tougher for the Indian economy going forward, even though we are recovering from the headwinds that I talked about earlier, the demonetization and the uh, initial uh, glitches with the implementation of G uh, GST. Last point I want to talk about in terms of, of, uh, of the current outlook is the uh, financial system and the cleanup that's, that's taking place. Now, uh, in the period, last period of very strong growth, which was 2006, 7, 8, there were substantial investments made in infrastructure and so on. Uh, and after that, as growth slowed, a number of these investments ran into trouble. And that started the process of rising NPAs in the system. Now typically, uh, when you have rising NPAs, the best thing to do is to clean up, to essentially deal with the bad stuff, so that with clean balance sheets, banks can be put back on track and can lend again. It's taken us far too long to clean up the banks, uh, partly because uh, really the system didn't have the instruments to deal with bad debt. On the one hand, the bankers and the uh, entrepreneurs were not appropriately incentivized to do the right deals, but also, legally speaking, we didn't have the right structures. Now, after a lot of, of work, we finally have the structures, for example, a bankruptcy code, but that cannot be the only way we clean up. The bankruptcy code has to be one element of a larger cleanup plan. And we'll talk more about this later. But nevertheless, the broader point is we have had a buildup of NPAs, non performing assets in the banking system. Now many of them are out there in, in the open. We now have to reduce it. That requires a multi pronged action from the banks, uh, from the judicial system, from the government in recapitalizing and strengthening the governance of the banks. That's something that we need to do. So this is uh, a, a very quick picture of where we are today. Uh, uh, would, would have been helped by the graphs, but don't worry. Uh, you basically got the gist. Uh, so now let's move to, okay, so what should we be uh, sort of uh, proud about in terms of what has happened to the good in India in recent times? I think there, there is a, a fair amount of stuff to be happy about. India, 7% growth does create a fair amount of success. For example, uh, you know, the government has essentially moved to creating banking accounts for all. Not all these accounts are used, but a lot more people have bank accounts than, used to have, they, than people used to have in the past. And what this does, it, it, once it brings people into the system, you can do a lot of things which are beneficial for development. For example, direct benefit transfers. Uh, for example, instead of somebody taking money and going to the fair price shop to pay for it, uh, 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 and then uh, essentially getting subsidized uh, goods at the fair price shop, you can give them the money to buy anywhere. You can make, uh, uh, you know, uh, they can buy from private stores also. All this is possible. Once you have the possibility of making direct benefit transfers, some of you who just come from India know, for example, that on your gas, um, your gas cylinders, uh, today the government uh, for subsidized gas cylinders, which presumably most of you don't have, but for subsidized gas cylinders, it makes the payment directly into bank accounts and so on. So the, that's one example of uh, the successes at the micro level. There are a number of stories of micro level successes in India today. E-payments is another example. Today we have what is called the Universal Payment Interface, the UPI, uh, run by National Payment Corporation of India. And it's made it possible for anybody who has a bank account to make a transfer to anybody else who has a bank account very simply and easily. And because that bridge is available to any of the financial institutions who want to use it, it has allowed for competition. Unlike here, for example, where you are locked into Venmo or locked into Apple, there you're not locked into anybody when you have the public payment bridge. And small value payments can be made across it. And if you look at what's been happening on UPI, there's a hockey stick increase in the payments that are made on UPI. Third example of what's gone right is, is resources. You know, in the period of very strong growth, resources like um, spectrum, 
resources like iron ore mining rights, uh, um, other uh, coal mining rights, were essentially not handled very carefully by the government. The resources had increased tremendously in value, but the transparency about the allocation and how they were done was very, very, uh, was, was fairly non-existent. Because of the furor on how these have been allocated in the past, because of uh, very many allegations of corruption and so on, India has become much more transparent about allocating resources. It's very hard today to allocate big, a big chunk of government resources without going through a proper auction. And that has brought transparency, much more transparency into the system. That's again been an improvement this time in, in governance. I talked a little bit about the bankruptcy code. One of the important things to remember is the bankruptcy code is an important way of resolving financial distress at corporations. But our judicial system has limited capacity. You cannot push all the corporations that have problems into the bankruptcy system because the bankruptcy system simply doesn't have the judges, the lawyers, to handle that amount of action. So really, the bankruptcy system should serve as a shadow. If you don't negotiate outside of bankruptcy and do deals outside of bankruptcy, you will move into bankruptcy and it will be harder at that point for all of you. So agree to a solution now. That's the way the bankruptcy system works in developed countries. It's the way the system should work in India. Bankruptcy has to be the last resort. Way before you get to bankruptcy court, you should renegotiate some of these bad debts. The problem today, it seems to me, is that we're moving towards pushing more and more into the bankruptcy court. Before we know it, it will get clogged, overloaded, and will have the same problems that our judicial system has everywhere else. And therefore, it's very important we step back from that and ensure only the rare cases go into the bankruptcy court for resolution. The goods and services tax is another good thing that has happened recently because uh, it allows for a much better system of taxation, gives, makes India into an overall unified market, and also gives more people incentives to pay taxes to become part of the formal tax system. And as you know, one of the big problems in India is we collect too little in taxes relative to the incomes that are made. And so the goods and services tax is an improvement. Of course, the way it was rolled out was not, uh, was not the best. Too many glitches, uh, too, many, um, um, too much uh, uh, which was not thought through. But nevertheless, in the long run, it will be beneficial. And then, of course, the uh, uh, program to clean up India, Swachh Bharat, whether it's cleaning up the uh, the Ganges, or, or ensuring that everybody has access to toilets. Uh, this is extremely important, uh, not just from the perspective of having a good environment, but from health. You know, one of the biggest problems in India is malnutrition. And there are people who have linked malnutrition to the uh, lack of hygiene in, uh, in for example, uh, the way uh, the, the non-use of toilets so to speak, uh, open defecation and so on. And so it is very important that we have a process where by, of, of improving uh, both cleanliness and hygiene in society and Swachh Bharat Bhal, to the extent that it emphasizes this is a very important uh, program. Again, like many Indian programs, implementation lags behind the inspiration. Uh, we need implementation to catch up. Uh, I think few would argue that India is, is clean enough today, but there are uh, uh, a lot of successes. There are uh, cities like Indore, which uh, uh, in the span of three years has moved from becoming from being one of the dirtiest cities in India to becoming one of the cleanest. And so uh, I think there is scope for improvement, and, there, uh, and this is something that catches on. Um, I'm sure some of you as students in Indian schools might have had a Swachh Bharat day where you went and cleaned up something, uh, um, uh, some open field which was full of uh, garbage uh, bags. Uh, I hope you did. Uh, but, uh, but that's something that I think that we're getting more of a sense of and it's very important. But these are all micro steps. How is it that we're growing at 7% because what is the, I mean apart from GST, what is the what, is the, what are the big ideas? Well, a lot of Indian growth happens at night 
as, as, a, as a commentator once pointed out, that is, you know, without the government doing anything, because we are a relatively poor country, uh, there is a lot of scope for us to grow. Dairy farming starts up because you can send milk to the town. Then as these remunerative activities start up locally, uh, people start opening shops, former shops selling clothes because now people have the incomes to buy clothes. Soon there is a kiosk which sells uh, cell phone cards. And before you know it, there's a bank branch which opens up, right? So development can be quite rapid uh, and can happen because of a few small things that change, okay? Now some of that is done by the government, some of it is done <coughs> for other reasons, but we are capable of, of strong growth. And that is why I think it's important to take the 7% now as granted. If we go below 7%, we must be doing something wrong. And take that as the base above which we have to build, at least for the next 10, 15 years. How do we get that two percentage points more of growth that get us to employ all those millions of people? We, we have to create one million jobs a month. One million jobs a month to employ the people coming to the labor force. Right? And that's without addressing the extensive unemployment and underemployment that already exists in India. Right? Our labor force participation for women is 26% or something. Right? That's miserable. How do we get more women to participate in the labor force? But for that we have to create jobs, right? Now we have to create jobs both for men and for women. That needs a tremendous amount of job creation. So what's holding us back? I think if you look at the bottlenecks today, I would say there are three big bottlenecks. One is stored infrastructure, and I'll come to talk a little more about infrastructure. But we simply are not able to create the infrastructure in the size and measure that, for example, China did. And that's very important because construction is the industry that drives growth in the early stages. And it's very important because it creates a lot of unskilled jobs directly, which is important to absorb the people who want to move out of agriculture. They move out from back-breaking agriculture to slightly less back-breaking construction, right? But that's a path upwards. And construction first employs them, but construction, as I talked about the road that uh, uh, just a little while ago, construction creates so many other opportunities. Look at any Indian highway that's built and see the number of motels, restaurants, etc. that are coming on either side. Uh, gas stations uh, and eventually banks and all that. And that's saying that infrastructure creates growth, right? And of course infrastructure, one of the reasons we don't have strong manufacturing is because of the weakness of our logistic system, of our system of, uh, of power generation, logistics, etc. All that is too costly to set, you know, uh, moderately skilled manufacturing. We have high skilled manufacturing. Our auto ancillary industry is very, very strong, but we don't have the moderately skilled manufacturing. And one reason is because we don't have strong infrastructure. So we need infrastructure, and too many projects have been stalled and problematic. Second, for the first time in Indian history, we probably have enough power generation capacity to meet all the demand there is. And yet we have significant blackouts across the country. <coughs> Why is that? Because we simply have a really inefficient distribution system. And so a second order, um, or, or a second short term sort of uh, target should be to clean up the power sector and to make sure that the power that can be produced, which because it's not being produced as creating NPAs, non-performing assets in the power sector, the power that can be produced actually goes to the people who want the power. Again, the fact that they don't have power is holding back production, economic activity, and so on. And the third aspect, which is related to the first two, because they are the source of the ultimate problem, is cleaning up the banks. Because the banks are clogged with bad debt, the pace of credit expansion has been slowing for some time. Now that the non-bank finance companies are in a little bit of trouble, uh, the banks are starting to lend again, but more generally, they have not, uh, it has not been sufficient. So the question is, why haven't we fixed these? Uh, why is it that 
you know, some of these problems are festering. Uh, especially because, uh, you know, since 2014 we have a government which has the majority in the Lok Sabha on its own and has been uh, getting more of uh, more power in the Rajya Sabha. And I would argue that part of the problem in India today is there's an excessive centralization of political decision making. India can't work from the center. India works when you have many people taking up the burden. And today the central government is excessively centralized. Now an example of this is the quantum of decisions that requires the assent of the Prime Minister's office. The fact that almost every decision goes up to the Prime Minister's office, uh, every moderate decision, suggests that everything has to wait for the Prime Minister's office. Uh, one example is the time it takes to appoint CEOs of banks. It takes an inordinately long time. So banks are left headless. Now, you, if you have a bank with deep problems and it's left headless for a long time, the problems get worse. But that's because everything sort of moves up through the... Which means nobody wants to take a decision unless it has the approval up there, which means even if the Prime Minister works 18 hours a day, he's a very hard-working Prime Minister. Uh, there's only so much time he has, right? So, so, so I think that the, the, uh, the centralization is an example. And, and that also suggests the kind of projects that get done are the projects that catch the eye of the Prime Minister's office and it stays on them. For example, we built this massive statue. This <laughs> statue. When there's a will, there's a way. Can we find that will for everything else that we need to do? MPS. Well, that's one of the things we need to do, but there are a lot more. The second, I think second, centralization is one of the problems. The second is the unwillingness of the bureaucracy, including in the public sector, to take initiative. And this is a problem Pranabha and I were talking about this afternoon, which is that you know, really, one of the problems in India is there is no incentive in the bureaucracy to take anything that has any risk in it. Now, some of it was, was you know, by the nature of our statutes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, sort of uh, uh, talk a little loosely, but effectively, there's an anti-corruption statute in place, which basically said, if you as a government official do anything that gives an undue benefit to any private party, you can be held up for corruption. Now, there are so many actions you take which may have spillover effects, some of them positive, some of them uh, uh, negative across the board. But the idea was even if you aren't paid, there's no money that changes hands, and you're not, nobody shows that you benefited. The presumption is you were corrupt. Right? Now, how many officers are going to take risky decisions? when you know you can be hauled up by this, right? <coughs> Similarly, I mean, the, the problem is, I told you debt renegotiation is very important because you don't want everything to end up in the bankruptcy court. But bankers today don't want to do a deal with the promoter. They don't want to do a deal because the next day, if in fact that deal works out, remember, the deal works out, they wrote down the debt to 50% of its value, it turns out that, you know, that was a good thing to do, the firm flourishes, and then the CVC comes and says, how come you wrote it down to 50% of value? This firm is doing very well, you should have kept it at 100%. Of course, with 100%, it was never going to come out, because they had no incentive to invest, etc., etc. The problem is, under this environment, which banker is going to take a decision to write down the debt? So they don't. What they do is they look for expert committees, committees of impeachable citizens who will take the decision for them. Now, which committee of unimpeachable uh, you know, citizens will take a decision for the bankers, right? I mean, I don't know anything about banking. Why would I... I'm talking about the unimpeachable decision. <laughs> Uh, why would I, as the unimpeachable citizen, uh, actually substitute my judgment for the banker? All I can say is the processes they followed were okay. Now this is why everything ends up in the court. 
because nobody wants to take a decision outside the court for fear that these organ, 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 uh, they, they may be accused of corruption. So what we have is a system that punishes sins of commission, whether they were intended or not, but doesn't punish sins of omission. You can sit on your loans and not do anything, let them grow, you know, you just have to hide enough that they don't grow too big, and not get penalized. But you don't get rewarded for actually cleaning up the system. You need to change that. The government has passed some law, uh, some, some changes in the corruption uh, um, in, in those statutes I talked about. We have to see what effect they have. But this is a problem in India where the, uh, where the people, uh, where the um, uh, bureaucracy has taken a step back in the last few years. I would say ever since the corruption scandals uh, of uh, the early part of this decade, the bureaucracy has stepped back, which actually uh, becomes problematic uh, because then uh, nothing, uh, nothing uh, sort of uh, goes through. And of course, we've had, uh, because the bureaucracy is not following up, because of this lack of follow through, uh, and because of the centralization, they combine to ensure the same problems keep coming back. One example of this is some of you may have heard that we have a core problem again. India has some of the largest coal reserves in the world, right? But we have a coal shortage. How can we have a coal shortage when, when we have some of the largest coal reserves? Because we have a coal monopoly, Coal India, which is a public sector monopoly, which is not that efficient. Now, we had the same problem in 2014. And the government went all out to solve it. And in fact, the problem was solved. We had for a time being excess coal. Nobody wanted to take coal because their, their inventories were full. But then two years later we have the same problem again. Why? Because we didn't follow up, we didn't persist with what we had, we didn't think about now we've solved this problem, let's make sure it never happens again. And so today, today we have a coal problem again. So what this says is we need to rethink the process of governance that we are not really doing an adequate job. And as we grow at an inadequate rate, the concerns we should have get stronger and stronger. There are too few good jobs being created outside agriculture, which means that agricultural unrest is high, because productivity in agriculture is low, incomes in agriculture are low, too many people depending on too few, too little land. Um, and therefore what we have is because we cannot create jobs for them, we cannot create more income, we have repeated appeasement by the state governments and sometimes the central government through loan waivers. Let them take loans and then we waive them. It's basically a transfer to agriculture because we can't generate more incomes. Because loan waivers are the worst way to transfer. Because who do you think gets loans in agricultural areas? Not that poor uh, sort of uh, laborer who has no, no assets. It's the moderately rich farmer, right? And so when you waive loans, who gets the benefit it's a very poorly targeted form of intervention. It's not only poorly targeted, it creates bad incentives because I have an incentive to take the loan, not pay, wait for the waiver to come, right? And so what does that do to agricultural credit? It spoils it. Unfortunately, this is something that more and more political parties are getting into the game of making a pre-election promise we will do a loan waiver and then finding post-election they have to spend a lot of funds for the loan waiver, which prevents them from doing the natural development which agriculture needs. Better irrigation, better seeds, better technology, etc., which would be far better than the loan waiver. Now, aside from this, we're also getting unrest from middle class, mid, I should say the middle class, uh, people like the Patidars, people like the Jats, because jobs are few in number. Here are people who are getting more educated and they're saying, where are the jobs? The only jobs are in government, right? So those are very hard to get, especially if we're competing in the open quota, so we want reservations. And so the demand for reservations is growing because of the lack of jobs being, being created. And of course, all this results in divisive politics, uh, basically uh, as a diversion from the record for, of performance. So let me come finally uh, to, uh, very quickly, through uh, the, the seven items I want to talk about and, and I'll spend a minute and a half on each. Uh, infrastructure. We've already talked about need for physical connectivity, etc., etc. Why aren't we doing more in infrastructure? 
the key bottleneck in infrastructure, the key bottlenecks are two. One is land acquisition. We simply cannot acquire land in an effective way. Now, the problem is not an easy one. India has a very high density of population, uh, a density which is you know, equal to some of the more denser parts in Europe. Try building a highway in Europe. Today you simply will not be able to do it because everybody will object, not in my backyard. Well, this is what happens in India. Once you want to build a highway, you have to acquire land. And who are you going to acquire land from? Immediately politicians sense an opportunity, civil society senses, senses an opportunity, everybody is fighting for the farmer. It becomes very hard to acquire land. We need a sensible process of land acquisition which protects the rights of the people whose land is being acquired but doesn't depend on too much government capacity to acquire that land. The land acquisition bill that we have, remember you don't need to acquire all the land, some of it is anyway sold privately, it's the holdouts that you want to acquire land from, but the land acquisition bill we have today is simply not operational. It can't be uh, for the kind of government capacity that we have. We can't actually acquire the land. Um, what we need is an easier system to operate, one which recognizes the limits on government capacity, but also recognizes that the people selling the land often can be duped, and we need to protect them. Now, there are some practices which are emerging in India which are working quite well. For example, Telangana acquired the land for its, for its capital by essentially promising the farmers who gave the land, you give me five acres, I will give you back two acres of developed land. So essentially what they acquire is an equity stake in the project through the developed land. We need to think more about such kinds of structures rather than emphasize we're going to do a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, sort of government action here because government simply doesn't have the capacity. The second bottleneck in infrastructure projects has been environmental clearances. That environmental clearances, India has a need to protect the environment. But at the same time, we have to recognize we also have a need for development. How do we balance these two? We need a high quality regulator who understands the pros and cons, but is also able to give permissions in a clear, transparent, uh, obviously non-corrupt way. We need to create that kind of regulator because today we don't have uh, that. We need more regulatory and better regulatory capacity there. Let me turn next from infrastructure to human capital. You know, again, uh, I think uh, Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat, uh, sort of created a misconception about India and the rest of the world, that we have this wonderful education system uh, in which people turn down Cornell to study in the IITs and so on. The, the, the IITs are, are, are really quite good, but where we are failing is at every part of the education system. We get all our kids today into school. That's a success because earlier that use wasn't the case. But they don't stay in school. The dropout rate is very high. right? And so what that means is the kid is dropping out because the kid and his parents don't feel that they're getting enough from the school. The quality of education needs to be improved. In fact, if you look at the ASER uh, evaluations of Indian uh, primary education, it's appalling. Uh, the quality of education, the, what these kids know, is actually falling as opposed to rising. We need to take a serious look because if we don't educate our kids, we will not have the human capital for the 21st century. Um, uh, and that's, that's extremely important. In fact, uh, uh, a, a, a Hashik Huang in, uh, in, at MIT argues one of the big differences between India and China is precisely the quality of the uh, education system, uh, the schooling system. China, when it started its growth, had a much better schooling system, many more years of education in its, uh, in its children, and therefore could produce the workers that could go into the factories and do uh, decent jobs. India has far fewer of those workers, qualified workers that could go that are factory ready, and that's partly because our primary education system doesn't work as advertised. We need a serious focus on that. Now, you may say, okay, primary education maybe not so good, but don't we have a great university system? Yes, in pieces we have a great university system. But overall, 
fact that so many of you are here suggests <laughs> not simply we're not employing we're not keeping back the best and the brightest too many are leaving because they don't find uh, uh, Indian universities uh, up to the mark of course we have good IITs of course we have good uh, good IISC and so on but the large uh, uh, mass of colleges are not providing the education our kids need to compete in the 21st century. This includes a whole bunch of problems. One, pricing. We keep prices too low and poorly targeted. So everybody gets a cheap education, but the education is worth what you pay for. It's not worth very much, right? Um, that's in the public sector colleges and so on. There are, of course, private sector colleges which make you pay through the nose, but many of them don't have adequate certification processes which say they're providing a good education. So a lot of them provide actually mediocre education that the students only realize when they go looking for a job and find nobody employs them because they don't have a good uh, education. So we also have fairly poor targeting of courses to the needs of the students. Uh, we have too little focus on training the teachers and research. For example, we've created a whole load of new IITs. Earlier it was just rebranding the the REC's IITs, so Roorkee became IIT Roorkee and so on. Now new IITs are being set up. The problem is not that, you know, physical infrastructure for the IITs, we can always build that physical infrastructure. The real problem is we don't have the teachers. Where do we get the teachers? How do we train the teachers? That is India's single biggest problem in higher education. And to do that, we have to really first have high quality institutions like the IITs take up the role of not just teaching the undergrads, but teaching the teachers. But we also have to be much more open to pulling people from abroad. People like you who go out and do masters and PhDs and bring them back and give them positions to train, train, the teach, uh, to train our students going forward. Essentially, uh, improving the education system in India is a must. It can also be a way, effectively, of us expo uh, creating exports. Now, this is all about fancy education, even simple things like skilling. Skilling, um, it's hard, uh, in, now some of you have just come from India, how to find a good carpenter, how to find a good plumber. Why is it that we can't produce more of these? Because training these job, people into these jobs is not that difficult. But yet we find that we don't uh, have uh, adequate capacity here. In, in, in construction, one of the problems is we're running out of civil engineers who are, are adequately trained. So broadly, uh, what we need is a massive jump in the quality of human capital. And to some extent, the HRD minister, the person in charge of HRD, should not be an also ran in the government. Here's, here's, a, here's a portfolio for somebody that I, I don't know what to do with. It has to be the job for the most talented minister in the government. That has to be the job for the most talented minister because clearly it is the most important job in government today. Um, then, just to a related area, intellectual capital. Now, India is moving closer to the frontiers of, of knowledge. Not yet there, but getting closer. Now, we have a perfect system for a country at the frontier. We have open debate, we have uh, uh, a democratic system, um, you know, people can say what they want for the most part. Uh, it's a pretty open system, right? And it's an advantage we have. Few developing countries at our stage of development have that kind of openness, right? But in order to take advantage of that, we also have to have the process of producing knowledge through debate, through discussion, through research and development. We are not producing as much intellectual capital as we could produce. Uh, take, for example, the number of universities we have in the top few. Very few of our universities. Maybe IISC shows up in the top you know, 200, maybe an IIT or two, but really not that many. Uh, we need to do far more to get more universities uh, producing that intellectual capital, producing the teachers at the very top. But even our corporations, right? We were heading uh, IT some time back, at least IT services, right? Infosys, uh, uh, Wipro, TCS. Where are they in artificial intelligence? Where are they in machine learning? What has happened? Why is it that we are falling behind? You know, 
And part of the problem is we are not investing as much in the future as we should invest. Uh, of course, we have a number of Chinese firms there. Hopefully, going forward, more Indian firms will, will take this up, will take up AI, robotics, and so on. But certainly, these, the, the reality is we're not quite there. One of the things that China does much better than India is welcome its diaspora. Right? It hunts around the world for the best and the brightest and tries to persuade them to come back to India. We have a really schizophrenic attitude towards foreign return. <laughs> <laughs> on the one hand, on the one hand, on the one hand, you know, who are these guys? What do they know about Indian conditions? Right? <laughs> I mean, we have a view in India sometimes as the laws of economics work differently in India, the laws of physics work differently. <laughs> you have to be in India to spend, you know, so that's one view. <laughs> the, the other view is that whatever comes from outside is golden. You know. Uh, so and so is Harvard return, so they're wonderful. <laughs> now, neither really serves our purpose. You can't pay obeisance just because the person is Harvard return, nor can you essentially reject them just because they're Harvard return. <laughs> what you have to do, which the Chinese do very well, is listen to everybody who wants to talk, and very soon decide if they have anything of value to say or nothing of value to say. They ignore the people who have nothing of value to say, no matter what their pedigree, and they pay attention to the people who have value to say. I would argue, and uh, you know, uh, maybe I'm talking pop history a little bit, but some of this has to do with the Chinese experience, which is that China was an independent country, and it essentially had its colonial experience with the Opium Wars. And China, which is a very strong country, was crushed in the Opium Wars. If you um, read the books, the, the trilogy that uh, um, uh, Amitabh Ghosh wrote, uh, you get a very uh, nice picture of the Opium Wars and, and the view from both sides. And, and what is interesting is that um, China basically had really archaic military methods and archaic weaponry. And I believe that historical experience has made China very different today that they're willing to absorb from the world whatever they can. Whatever they can, so long as it helps them. Right? And they don't take what you have to say as, as the gospel truth, but they're willing to listen. Now, we have to move towards that intermediate position in India. Not take it as a truth, nor reject it out of hand. How do we take what is good from it? And we have to be realistic that you know, we want to attract more talent to India, which means people of any nationality, any citizenship, uh, any race, color, whatever, uh, we need to attract more of them. And to do that, we have to provide them much better working conditions. But going forward, that will be beneficial. A more open India will be a stronger, a better India. Then last, uh, last uh, few things, democratic engagement. We need uh, in India, uh, more democratic engagement, and over time we are getting more of it. And I believe the big change is coming from more decentralization. That is, the states are getting more power. Uh, as the states get more power, they're focusing much more on what is important to the states and what is important to their electorates, which has been very useful. The rise of regional parties, especially the parties. The, the Dalit parties have been very important in emphasizing, certainly in the South, the emphasizing the importance of education and so on, and working to foster that. So I think that's uh, the, the political decentralization <coughs> is giving people more engagement. Panchayati Raj, that is power to the village, is also helping. We need more funding to migrate to the village. This is something every finance commission has proposed and moved towards. I think we need more of it. Because ultimately, a decentralized India uh, is going to be an important factor in democratic engagement. I think there's been historically uh, a, a sense of patronage politics in India. That is, what people want is not so much, they don't care about big, broad policies unless there's a wave that, 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 that sort of hits. 
Uh, but really they care about patronage, a little bit of goodies from the, uh, from the political candidate. And I think as India develops, this becomes less and less important. Uh, I think as people find that they don't have to bribe somebody to get a birth certificate or bribe the local policeman to get an FIR, working more as a matter of course, there's less need to rely on the politician to provide these for them. Today the politician is their intermediary with the system, especially for the poor people because he needs their vote, they need that, his intercession for some of the basic goods. I think as India becomes more uh, adept at providing these services, this will become less important. So democratic engagement on the things that matter will become more important. I think one of the things we shouldn't ignore is the role of technology here. Technology has been a big enabler in allowing services to be provided more directly. We talked about direct benefit transfers, but you know things like passports, things, uh, all these things are over time moving uh, online and it's becoming much better. Let me end with a couple of points. First is private sector independence. In order to have a decentralized government, in order to have a non-authoritarian government, you have to have alternative centers of power in the country. Okay? And in India, those alternative centers of power have not built up over time. That's because the private sector, which in this country, you have a Washington Post fighting tooth and nail against the government. Right? You, you, you have, in, in the time of Nixon, Washington Post essentially ran the, the investigation which brought down the government. Now, there are strong journalists in India, there are strong newspapers, but by and large, the government has a lot of sway over the press. The government has a lot of sway over uh, industrialists. Find one industrialist who, after a budget speech, says this was a bad budget. <laughs> be very hard to find. Why? Because they all know which side their bread is buttered. Mm -hmm. What does the government hold over them? You know, we just saw recently tariffs being increased. Well, uh, which industries are tariffs going to increase? Which industries are going to be protected? This was the whole problem with the license permit Raj. It's, you know, it still hasn't completely gone away. Similarly, think about the advertisements the government gives. One of the biggest controls of the press is I'm going to withdraw advertisements. You're not nice to me? Well, you won't get advertisements. That's a source of control. Uh, you know, credit. The good companies get credit. The not so good companies, I can tell the state-owned banks not to lend to them. Right? Now, all this is diminishing over time. Don't get me wrong. This is, uh, I'm not saying this is the state of affairs. What I am saying is the reins of power in government are significant. And we have to diminish these reins to get a more independent private sector. And that more independent private sector can then act as a check and balance. <coughs> Today, both the private sector and the government are in bed together. Right? And that is a problem. Because you don't get the independence, you don't get the check and balance, and it becomes too easy for government to turn authoritarian if it wants to. Right? So we don't have enough checks and balances, we need to work on that. Uh, certainly that is a problem uh, going forward. And that brings me to the issue of government capacity and institutional checks on the government. Now India is the world's third largest economy by PPP and around the fifth by GDP. Right? We just, we're on par with England sometime during this year, we'll, we'll overtake the UK. Now given that we are up there, we really need a, a capacity to have a first world administration. Certainly in our discussions at the WTO, at various other places where we're defending our national rights, we need to have the national capacity. But we simply don't have that capacity. All too often we lose our cases there because we haven't made the right representation. We aren't even able to get those criminals who cocked a snoot at the Indian system and vanished abroad. We can't bring them back because we can't persuade those judicial systems that they should be brought back to India for trial, right? Which one of them has been brought back? Nobody, right? So we need to improve government capacity. We have not enough specialists, insufficient training, and uh, certainly not enough motivation, not enough morale, uh, and this is a, a, a problem. Now, at one level, government capacity is weak. 
But at another level, government capacity, government uh, sort of is, is relatively unconstrained. We don't have the checks and balances on government which protect the, the average citizen from arbitrary action against government. We have many more than the, uh, the average developing country by all means. The Supreme Court is a very strong check and balance. The uh, Election Commission is a strong check and balance. But we need to work on improving all these. right? And, and that is something that we absolutely need in order to have a functioning economy in the 21st century. We need to have government capacity, but we also need to have checks and balances which limit where government can exercise its authority. And for that, we need these institutions. What is interesting about India is every so often, one of these institutions will find its role. For example, the election commission, <coughs> Mr. Station, suddenly became an election commission with teeth. And it has continued that, that role. Today, the notion that an election will be stolen in India is something that most people don't think is possible, simply because we have the systems in place to protect against that. So similarly, we have a number of institutions, the CAG uh, uh, under uh, the, the Controller and Auditor General, uh, the Competition Commission of India, whole bunch of institutions that are coming up. We need to strengthen them because ultimately they are checks and balances on the government. Let me end by saying, you know, India is now on the you know, 10, 18 years into the 21st century and I'm still talking about how we should prepare for the 21st century. <laughs> but really, uh, we need to think about what we need to do. I've, I've given a few uh, thoughts on where we, we need to strengthen. Again, I want to emphasize at the risk of, uh, I don't want to sound overly negative, there's a lot to complement India on the 7% growth over 25 years. Uh, there are lots of things that have happened which have made India a better, uh, 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 a more, um, uh, a stronger, uh, a more uh, united country, but there's a lot more that needs to be done, especially given the fact that we're not creating the jobs that our youth need, and so we need to focus going ahead. But there is a broader issue that that I, for one, don't know that we have consensus on, which is what kind of India uh, do we want going forward? What kind of country do we want? Do we want a country that is politically liberal? Certainly some of the decisions of the Supreme Court in recent times uh, go in that direction. Or do we want a country which is muscularly majoritarian, which emphasizes populist nationalism? And certainly there are some parties which move in that direction. Do we want a centralized country with, with the center really strong or do we want a decentralized country with the center taking care of some of the things that a center has to take care of, for example, like defense and foreign policy, but a lot more is decentralized to the states so that they can do some of the work that is needed and down to the panchayat level so that the villages and our towns, our municipalities can do what is needed. Should we emphasize opportunity? That is let the markets flourish, uh, let's create capacity for people to enter the markets, but let's not intervene too much. Or should we continuously focus on redistribution? <coughs> Think about the kinds of, uh, of, uh, of distributions that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, target the poorer segments of society. Or should we mix both? Should we be market friendly rather than business friendly? Or vice versa? Uh, how much should the state <coughs> occupy the heights of the economy? Or should we allow the state, uh, that is the, the business part of the state, to erode? And we seem to be doing. The public sector banks are in trouble, Air India is in trouble, uh, a lot of the telecom companies that the state own are in trouble. Essentially the state is eroding. <coughs> is that a good thing? Should we let it go that way? Uh, should we engage with the world? Or should we be isolationists? Should we welcome foreign companies, welcome uh, immigration? even as we send a lot of people outside? Or should we say, we're going to build a wall around India? Um, there are different visions on offer uh, in India today. But India really needs to decide which way to go. And unless we have a consensus on what the overall vision is, uh, some of our development path will be you know, two steps forward, one step back. Uh, and, and to some extent, uh, you know, we need uh, a, an articulated vision to preserve more policy coherence in what is really a very large, complex, and uh, I hope for those of you who are interested in research, 
very interesting country. So let me stop there. And, uh, But because we don't have very much time, um, I'm going to ask you to ask uh, to make uh, ask a question and not give a counter lecture. So <laughs> I, uh, I, I already promised uh, Pranamda that. Uh, one is uh, something that uh, in the public media comes up occasionally. You mentioned the centralisation and things getting stuck in the Prime Minister's office, uh, public media, including last week, the Central Information Commission came out with a statement that Mr. Raghuram Rajan sent a letter in February 2015 about the large, largest willful defaulters of loans in, in India. And it's stuck in the Prime Minister's uh, office. It's not been released so far. So in that context, I'd like you to draw out on your comments on what you might call crony capitalism in India. Second, again quick, when we emphasize decentralization, one of the problems with decentralization is that it powers up to the state government. The state governments quite often want to give powers to the below, municipal or village governments. And do you have any suggestions? So they, want, they don't want to give. They don't want to give. It's not just a funding problem. They want to give power. No. Uh, so uh, on the first issue, uh, first to clarification, uh, the the list of willful defaulters is something that uh, is created by the banks going through a quasi-judicial process of declaring somebody who doesn't want to pay but has the capacity to pay as a willful defaulter. So this is something that, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of debate about whether it should be released or can be released. And I'm not sure what the legal issue on that is. What I did send the government was not a list of willful defaulters, but as I, I stated in my note to the, uh, to the parliament, that it was a list of frauds. These are people who had actually, you know, uh, stolen money, uh, or at least alleged to have stolen money. Now, until we actually do the judicial process and so on, I think uh, there may be an issue of whether they've gotten due process. And releasing that list may not be uh, fully appropriate. But certainly, it's, it's something that we should be taking action on. Hi, Professor. I write for the Times of India, and since you mentioned private sector independence in newspapers, my question is that we're not necessarily seeing this uh, convergence of business and politics only in India. Even in the rise of big money or uh, you know, lobbying or all the other things that we see in America and other developed countries, how do you see this global divergence or national divergence come about? And what are the ramifications of this existing convergence? Well, uh, uh, that's a very good question, and I didn't want to single out India. I think the, 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 this issue is broader. I was just saying that India needs more, more independence. Uh, I, I think uh, there are two factors that are creating a little bit of this convergence. Uh, one is we have uh, you know, much larger corporations today, and many of them reliant on government protection of intellectual property and this and that. Uh, essentially, uh, uh, when you have relatively few corporations, it's easier for the government to do deals. When you have many corporations that are smaller in size, uh, it's harder to you know, pick a few off and say, uh, you know, we're going to do deals with these guys because the others are left out of the net. So in some sense, this is a broader issue with capitalism. When capitalism consists of many more competing firms, uh, it becomes more politically decentralized also because there are many more sources of support for the dissident uh, from these, these firms. When it narrows and there are fewer, it becomes, uh, it becomes easier for the, the cronies to do deals. 
and, and I think that's that's really the uh, one way uh, that we get uh, sort of more distance in India, uh, a more competitive environment, uh, l uh, you know, uh, uh, less use of some of these sources of favors for, for example, tariffs or uh, you know flows of credit uh, to favored organizations or flows of advertisements, given that you're in the press, uh, and and I think that. Uh, would be something which would help create more of a distance. Yes. Hi, um, you mentioned about India's oil dependence. In fact, 80% of the oil requirements in India is metro imports. Um, seeing how hungry for power India is and it's going to remain for the next 20 years, and you mentioned that 7% growth for India should be taken for granted and should be aiming for more. How is India going to cope with uh, its vulnerability to you know oil imports and the geopolitical aspect that comes with it, and what role can privatization play in that sector, you know, to mitigate any of these uncertainties that India might encounter? Well, it is still possible. One should rule out the possibility of large fines of oil and gas, but of course we haven't had great success there. Uh, but whatever we have, we should use as efficiently as possible. And uh, one of the arguments on the table, I can't confess, I, I'm not an expert here, but is that we need better pricing of gas so that uh, there is more incentive to explore, extract, and use it. But also, you know, we have the chance to become a leader in renewable energy. Now, renewable by itself is not the answer because without storage it becomes a problem, right? So we also need either improvements in storage, which will come, or we need uh, some source of balancing power, which means gas or coal. Can we find ways to improve cleanliness of our coal? And can we improve the extraction of that coal? Those are all the arguments that we need to think about as we go forward. Certainly, uh, you know, it is in our interest to have a functioning global market and not to have that market too dependent on one or two suppliers uh, because you know, we are dependent on energy. Yeah. Hi. So when you talk about there are no ladies raising their hands. I, 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 uh, I was just actually looking for that, but I just spotted one right at the back. Okay. That's the next question. Okay. Uh, I was talking about the first question to general. In 2007, there's going to be a recession coming. A lot of people are talking that next year it's going to be hitting because it's been like a 10 year bull market, both in India and US. What do you think about that? Next year, recession, both in India and US. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So what do you think about it? I, I think it's very hard to predict. <laughs> Uh, recession. Uh, it's very hard to predict recessions. It's very actually very hard to predict anything in the in the stock markets or in in in, in uh, real cycles. I mean, I remember we did a study at the IMF. We've got enormous number of economists at the IMF, and well as chief economists, we did a study to try and find what our biggest failures were. Well, our failures almost always were in predicting the turning point. <laughs> it's always easy to say last year is going to be like this year. Right? And, you know, lo and behold, we got all that right. When last year is not like this year, right? When this year is much worse or much better, uh, very hard to predict. Uh, and uh, yesterday, uh, I, I was with uh, Bob Merton uh, at, a, at a conference and his parting words were, uh, you know, about predictability. Uh, I'm telling you 12 hours before Donald Trump becomes president. He's going to become president. <laughs> what trade do you take? Right? And think about it. You know he's going to become president in 12 hours. What trade are you going to do? It's not clear to me that we know. So, I, I, I sort of refrain from predicting the direction of economies or, uh, or markets. But, it, but in general, uh, I would say that uh, you know, for the emerging markets, this is a good time to be self-respect because, uh, you know, interest rates are going up. And when interest rates go up, one thing we know is capital tends to be jittery. So we need to show a good front, which means macro stability, which means bring down the, the fiscal further, uh, but also try and ensure you can do all the other things that enhance growth. Thank you. Yes, I'll go back. Hi, I'm Shafali. Uh, my question is, in terms of either the process used uh, to set economic policies or even in terms of economic policies, is there a gold standard out there in terms of countries that we can emulate? 
You know, uh, I mean, a lot of developed countries have good processes, uh, you know, checks and balances on economic policy setting. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in the United States, uh, the Council of Economic Advisors is often the, the entity that takes proposals that comes from elsewhere and subjects them to the challenge of does it meet the economic sort of uh, test, it, will it work as advertised. And that's an example of a structure which prevents bad, you know, my friends at the council always tell me that their main role is to prevent bad ideas from going through. Not necessarily to generate good ideas, but prevent the bad ideas from going through. But there have been other countries that have set up, you know, organizations that have had, had incredible effect. Uh, Australia had something called the Productive League Commission which essentially focused on how to improve productivity in the, in the Australian economy and over time the ideas got implemented. So uh, there are examples of very good policy making but ultimately the, the, the sense is you know, use experts, don't trust them too much but use them uh, and, and, uh, and have institutions that throw ideas into the system uh, and, and work on implementing. I mean China has done an extraordinary job of experimenting with policies on a small scale then rolling them out in a big scale. Uh, we could do more of that. Instead of starting big and finding out all the glitches, start small, find the glitches, then roll it, roll it out in a big way. There are lots of interesting... I mean, it goes back to keep your eyes and ears open to what's happening elsewhere. And that by itself will create a lot of improvement in policy. We have two minutes. And I'm going to take two questions, one over here and one over here. Yes, and then you can just quickly address them both, please. Uh, hi, my name is Sarga. Uh, you mentioned how we need to prevent the new bankruptcy code from getting to us and go for out of court settlement mechanisms. Uh, do you have any comments on the current systems that are promoting for out of court settlement mechanisms and how we could improve them? On, on the? On the settlement mechanism systems that prevent companies from going for critical positions. Uh, do I have any comments on the settlement mechanisms? Yeah. That, you know, no, no I, I think there are a bunch of systems there, mm -hmm. uh, some of them created by the RBI, some of them uh, just existed. The real issue is there has to be a willingness on the part of the banker and the promoter to come together. Earlier there was no threat of punishment for the promoter, so he could hang on indefinitely. He didn't have to come to the table. Now with the bankruptcy court, there is a threat of punishment. So this is a good time for the banker to do deals with the promoter. Problem is, the banker has to have confidence that once he does a deal, he will not later be accused of leaving money on the table. Now, if you want the banker to be really strict, it may leave the firm overburdened with debt, and it may not be able to grow them. So what you need is to give the banker more freedom of action. And I would say the way to do that is to trust you know, push more decision making onto the board, but have the board monitor the banker's performance. If the same banker makes 25 mistakes, there is a problem with the banker. If the banker makes one mistake out of 25, then maybe it's something that, that is not so, so worrisome, even if it's a big mistake. So we need better systems of, of monitoring and control. Last question. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, given uh, the state of jobs we have, the capacity and the potential to increase the capacity itself, how do you look at the large population of India as an advantage, disadvantage, and how best we can utilize that large population? See, I, I don't know whether that's a that's a question that uh, you know um, we, we have the population we have. We can't do anything about it. <laughs> right? So, so in that sense, we have to make the best we can emphasize the advantages of having this large population. And there are so many advantages. It's young. It's energetic. At the RBI, I found young kids were always, you know, no matter what their background, training, etc. You gave them a job, they came back three weeks later with the quality of output that made you really proud that they, they worked on it. So I, I think our youth are our strength, but they could become a very big weakness if we don't create the jobs and capacity in the youth to do those jobs. Because, you know, the young can also turn. So I think it's extremely important that we see that as a strength, but work on creating that strength.
Thank you so much. and debate and explore and that usually the easy answers aren't necessarily, uh, aren't the right ones. Um, Pranatha Arya said that this was like an Oscar ceremony and so like an Oscar ceremony we also have uh, a gift for you. <laughs> People come back here and uh, accept our gifts. 